for. We are all here to learn about spectacles. To, uh, spectacles. So to frame the evening, I'd like to share with you a story from the age of discovery. I chose a particular set of spectacles to talk about that are a wonderful intersection of both art, history, as well as science, and a smattering of adventure. I am talking about the first aerospace explorers. I will be talking about the first airborne travelers, a story that unfolded before an audience of hundreds of thousands of people. It involved hot air, a brave sheep, and a huge amount of taffeta, creating wonder and inspiration. And it started with the innovation of these guys, the Montgolfier brothers. They do look like cone heads. <laughs> the secret of the French aristocracy is revealed. So on the left, we have Joseph Michel, who is the 12th child of, and on the right, Jacques Etienne, who is the 15th child of a paper manufacturer. And uh, historically, like, first child heir, second child spare, third one, eh, maybe a priest, fourth one, eh, go in the army, fifth one, eh, go in the ar army, sixth one, eh, go in the army. So to be 12th and 15th, you, you really had to have some cunning and ingenuity and some stick to itiveness to be involved in the family business. So these guys were very creative. They were very inquisitive. And uh, Jacques Etienne especially started this whole craze. One night, he observed laundry drying over the fire, and he noticed that the fabric lifting over the hot air formed pockets. So he looked at that lifting fabric and thought, huh, I could do something with that. And in his first experiment, he built a, a, a small box out of uh, thin veneers of wood, lacquered it with paper, made it airtight, held it over some flaming bundles of straw to fill it with hot air, and released it. And to his surprise, the whole box hovered up gently inside. And so he was so excited, and he called his brother, and he was like, get a supply of taffeta and cordage quickly, and you will see one of the most astonishing sights in the world. So, oh my god. Let's, let's do more experience, or more experiments, more science. This is, this is France. Let's get a science. They scaled up their experiment, making a large envelope of taffeta lined with paper. Again, heirs to a paper for fortune. They had a lot of paper lying around. In, on the 14th of December in 1782, they, made, uh, they released this, their first hot air balloon, and it was, it was a success. It drifted up into the sky, and then, and then a few minutes later came down. So they, they were like, that was really cool. Let's go bigger. Their first public spectacle was a few months later, June 4th of 1783, in the marketplace in Annonay. And amid great cheers and excitement and applause in front of thousands of people, they released another hot, uh, another hot air balloon, which proved a success. Uh, this amazing spectacle, it was something that, that had never been done before, people had never seen, and, and they watched just uh, awestruck as this, this gr graceful balloon slowly lifted into the skyline and drifted away. Absolutely astonishing. So this marvelous new contraption stayed aloft for about 10 minutes and it covered a distance of one and a half miles before it, it started to descend and it hit the ground. Now, amazement, wonder, inspiration going up, a completely different spectacle going down. <laughs> the balloon descended into a nearby village where it touched down and still semi-buoyant from the cooling air, it bounded down the street where it seemingly was chasing two panicking cartmen. <laughs> they assumed that this giant bobbing sky nightmare beast from its motions, it seemed to be chasing them and it was alive, bouncing up and down. Uh, they were terrified and everyone assumed that this like horrific nightmare monster had come to attack them and was bobbing down the street. So uh, the terrified townspeople rushed it, stabbed it to death with pitchforks, <laughs> beat it with sticks and stones until it deflated, then they tied the remains to a horse to be dragged away from their town as fast as possible. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> as a result from this experiment, the police decided maybe it would be a really good idea to issue announcements to the surrounding towns that maybe something would be happening, don't be scared. So apart from the panic at Gonesse, the Montgolfier brothers decided that their experiment was a resounding success. So they had to go bigger. Undaunted, and with the help of a wallpaper manufacturer named Jean-Baptiste Jean Réveillon, 
They built the Aerostat Réveillon, a 37,000 cubic foot taffeta balloon en envelope, again lined with wallpaper, and they coated it with alum for fireproofing. And this being the height of neoclassical romanticism, the balloon was brilliant sky, bowl, sk brilliant sky blue with gold flourishes, signs of the zodiac, quite the spectacle. Now they also attached a gondola to this version. For their next experiment, they wanted to determine if this technology could carry passengers. This was a big unknown factor. The biggest unknown factor, they had no idea if people could survive the ascent in a balloon. They had no idea if people could breathe the atmosphere above the ground. So King Louis XVI, what a guy, he had a great idea. He was like, guys, why don't you experiment on condemned criminals? <laughs> Eesh. Uh, don't worry, his people kind of turned on him. He was a bit of a jerk. So uh, the Montgolfier brothers were like, no, 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 no. Slow a votre roll, king. Slow a votre roll. And they had a different uh, they had a different idea, and again, dites avec moi, science! They decided to use different test subjects. They decided that a sheep closely resembled the human anatomy, and thus would be a perfect test candidate. So they found a sheep, named her Montesiel, which means climb the sky. Uh, they also selected a duck, because everyone knows ducks can fly and would totally be fine up in the sky, but they wanted to use the duck as a test for the effects of the aircraft. And the rooster, which can't fly, was a control against the duck. So again, totally rigorous scientific method. We're, we're good to go. So what happened? On the 19th of September in 1783, at the Palace of Versailles, in front of Louis the, the 16th and Marie Antoinette and the entire French court and a crowd of 130,000 spectators, the balloon was filled with hot air and then boarded by probably a, a reticent sheep, rooster, and duck <laughs> and untethered. There was a bit of drama where it looked like it would wobble and capsize, but then it gracefully went aloft and drifted off to the hills. The first <laughs> aircraft with passengers sustained an eight-minute flight going about two miles away from Versailles. As it came down, the audience anxiously tracked the balloon. They didn't, they didn't know what to expect. Would the occupants of the balloon be okay? They, yeah, they were totally fine. Uh, when the basket was found, discovered, it was tipped over, and the, the duck and the rooster looked a bit stunned, but were fine. And Montaciel, again, this, this goddamn mouton heroic, was totally unfazed and just grazing some grass nearby, just chilling, not a care in the world. And as a delightful historical anecdote, Marie Antoinette, who liked playing shepherdess, adopted Montaciel, and Montaciel lived the rest of her days happily at the Palace of, Surva uh, Palace of Versailles in the royal sheepfold, eating candy and marshmallows every day. <laughs> so this, this was a resounding success. So what do they do? Go bigger! Since the occupants were unscathed, the king gave the go-ahead to attempt human flight. You know, non-condemned criminal, the hero type human flight. So again, they, uh, they went with a 60,000 cubic foot, 75 foot tall balloon with 12 signs of the zodiac in gold, uh, golden decorations of Florida de Lee, suns with the king's face on them, royal monograms on a deep blue background, uh, red and blue sashes, golden eagles, you know, completely understated, totally tasteful. And just one month later, the first manned flight with uh, Pilatre de Rosier and, Marquis de, and the Marquis of Darlon took flight, and it was a complete success. And they were they were aloft for several minutes. They uh, for about twenty minutes. They traveled about five five miles, and everything was a resounding success. And this just kicked off this this spectacle. It, it kicked off so much excitement and just this this hot air uh, enthusiasm and fervor from the success of this experiment. Now. At this particular experiment with the first manned flight of an untethered hot air balloon, uh, some jerk in the audience, he turns, 
to the guy next to him. He's like, sir, frankly, what's the use of flying in the air? <laughs> Am I right? So this jerk happened to have been speaking to Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> who, as the eminent scientist of his day and ambassador to France, was of course personally invited to attend this spectacle. And uh, so he, he turned around and clapped back, sir, what's the use of a newborn baby? So, uh, if this rhetorical question is not immediately clear, it's like, this is the, be like, shut up, dude. This is the beginning of something important. This has great potential. This is marvelous. Enjoy the show, damn it. So, despite the naysayer, Franklin was captivated by the experience, and he, en he wrote just dozens of accounts of the events. He documented proceedings. He was involved with the science. He helped fund experiments. And he did science. And he, uh, he did his best to promote this exploration. And uh, the day that he saw the first manned flight, he said, all eyes were gratifying with, gratified with seeing it rise majestically from above the trees and ascend gradually above the buildings, a most beautiful spectacle. So I'd like to leave you with a note of inspiration and hope and, and also in the, in the vein of uh, what's the use of baby, just like, enjoy the damn show. Um, let us pave the way to some discoveries in natural philosophy of of which at present we have no conception. So uh, let us turn to our awe, our wonder, our appreciation of these great spectacles that they may inspire us to, to, to do things that are pragmatic, to do new things, to do wonderful things. And remember, a sheep, a duck, and a rooster totally beat us for the title of first aircraft ascent. So to spectacle and to Montesiel. Tonight, we have six fine speakers on board. We have Casey Selden, Annetta Black, Richard Cody Nichols, Amy Widowson, Nadia Lev, and Edmund Zagarin to speak to us about spectacles.